So good evening, all. I request uh, Dr. R. Kumila, Professor and Head, uh, Department of Civil Engineering, SVC, uh, to give welcome address. Uh, is it audible, Mr. Kalaiwanan? Yes, ma'am, it's audible, ma'am. Yes, sir. Uh, so thank you, Mr. Kalaiwanan, and uh, uh, good evening, all of you. Uh, I'm very happy to welcome you all for uh, another webinar session uh, on uh, Chennai's path to flood prevention. So, so this session will be delivered by uh, Mr. Alvish uh, Ranjit John Yanaraj, so who is a technologist uh, from Water Resources Engineering, uh, Toronto and Region Conservation Authority, Canada. Uh, so on behalf of all the uh, attendees uh, present here, so I warmly welcome Mr. Alvish uh, for this webinar. So, uh, so as you know, uh, the Department of Civil Engineering of SBCE uh, is now uh, uh, taking keen interest on organizing uh, uh, many programs, uh, uh, may, maybe guest lectures or webinars, uh, mainly for the benefit of uh, uh, the students and the faculty members. And especially we are focusing on uh, um, industry persons uh, so, so as to develop uh, a good industry institute interaction. And also in order to uh, uh, give an exposure, industrial exposure mainly to the students, uh, community so we are uh, focusing on these kind of programs and uh, i am very happy that our faculty members uh, uh, they are enthusiastic in identifying uh, resource persons from industries and uh, they are uh, i mean they are organizing many programs uh, nowadays so i am very happy on that so uh, today also i'd like to uh, congratulate uh, uh, mr kalaiwanan and mr dravya balan uh, for uh, bringing such a um, um, technical expert especially in the field of water resources engineering. Uh, so to give uh, some uh, exposure to our students uh, on this particular area. So I'm very happy on this. And uh, I welcome all the participants present here. So because uh, even though it's evening, so uh, so you have turned up uh, uh, for this webinar. So I'm very happy about that also. So on behalf of everyone present here and uh, uh, I welcome once again the speaker, Mr. Alvish, and uh, I welcome all the participants also, and I welcome all the faculty members who are present here uh, for this webinar. So I hope uh, uh, this webinar definitely uh, would be a useful one for all the attendees, uh, and I uh, wish this uh, program a great success. So um, uh, once again, I welcome you one and all. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you for the Mr. Alvis Ranjit John Yanaraj. Uh, Mr. Alvis did his bachelor's in agriculture and uh, irrigation engineering at CWR College of Engineering, Indi, Anna University, Chennai. He graduated in the year 2016. He has done many projects and internships during his undergraduate engineering degree, including a research internship at the University of Waterloo, Canada. For his research internship, he received a fellowship amount of uh, $3,900 from uh, Mitka uh, Global Inc. Uh, he did his uh, master's in applied science at the University of Toronto in the Department of Civil and Mineral Engineering uh, and his post-graduation thesis on spatial and temporal analysis of hydraulic conductivity, snow depth and uh, soil properties of uh, bioretention cell, which is uh, published in uh, International Journal, American Society of Civil Engineers. Uh, currently, Mr. Alvis is uh, working as a um, water resources technologist at Toronto and uh, Region Conservation Authority. Uh, Canada. Uh, regarding uh, research and uh, teaching experience, Mr. Alvis had uh, worked as a research and a teaching assistant in the University of Toronto, Canada between uh, September 2016 to September 2018. And uh, Mr. Alvis has uh, received many honors and awards, to mention a few. Um, Mitka's uh, Global Link Fellowship of Amount of $10,000 during the first year graduate studies at the University of Toronto. And uh, Mr. Alvis and his friend have won a Best Innovation Award given by Center for Technology Development and Transfer, an university for the work on uh, mitigating uh, problems for farmers using a geospatial device. Mr. Alvis has been enth enthusiastic and uh, passionate about learning new and tough softwares, also well experienced in handling softwares like uh, MikeFlet, EKHMS, ECRAS, uh, SWAT model, Modflow, PCS uh, WMM, MATLAB, Visual uh, Timo, Century model, Orc map, and OFAT. He holds a membership in International Erosion Control uh, Association. Uh, then, uh, when it comes to co curricular activities, uh, Mr. Alvish had actively organized several events and workshops in the Tech Fest 
and symposiums like uh, Guru Shetra, Krishi, and Greenix. So he was also a web designer for Ontario Waterworks Association, University of Toronto student chapter. Um, so without further delay, I request uh, our uh, today's speaker, Mr. Alvis, to take over the session. Thank you. Over to you, Alvis. Um, good evening, everybody. Um, thank you very much uh, for inviting me, um, Kalevanan. And um, thank you for allowing this presentation, um, HOD ma'am. Um, it's an honor to uh, present in um, your college to the students. Um, and uh, it's, it's um, great to see that these initiatives are taken by um, Indian colleges to encourage um, industry uh, partnerships with schools. And uh, I um, did not have the similar presentations given to me even in Anna University at that time, even though some other options came. So um, I request uh, and encourage students to make the best out of this opportunity. Um, I will start my presentation. One moment. Um, thank you very much for everybody, every, to everybody. Um, um, I hope you can see my screens and my slides. If you can't hear my audio or you can't hear, see my screen, um, please message me in the to two and a half years in um, Toronto's uh, flood prevention industry in the government, similar to the PWD, Public Works Department in Chennai. Um, and um, before that, I've been uh, a master's thesis researcher at the University of Toronto, um, researching on systems that prevent flooding in cities. So based on my experience, I will uh, convey my humble knowledge to you. And um, I'm very well sure that um, Kalevanan and um, your other professors, including your HOD, they may be more um, knowledgeable in on-site Chennai issues, little more than me, because I've been away from Chennai for four to five years. But um, I'm sure I will share the knowledge I have and they will be able to definitely guide you and fill you in with any other um, things I missed. Um, having said this pre note and thanking Kalevanan and your HOD and other professors for this opportunity, I will start my presentation. Um, I would start by saying that um, every urban city generally based on hydrology can be divided into some um, sub watersheds, some watersheds and um, you know, due to copyright issues, I'm not able to share um, high quality imagery or anything of the Toronto area. But this is an image I took from this online link. And you can see this is um, Toronto area. And um, you have probably one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, and eight, nine watersheds. Um, a watershed is basically um, um, an area in which any water that falls through rain will gather in one point. And um, similarly, Chennai has 
um, some watersheds as well. And um, this is um, Lake Ontario in Toronto. And this is um, the Bay of Bengal in India. And um, in this aspect, having like one border full with water and the remaining um, full of sites full of land, Toronto and uh, Chennai are pretty similar. Um, unlike cities like Bangalore and um, Chicago and stuff. So when we compare the water basins, um, my apologies, Chicago, Chicago also is similar to Toronto. So when we come to water basins, you know, I have just listed um, some water basins, which I showed in the previous map in Toronto. And I have listed the water basins in Chennai, which um, Kalevanan is probably more aware of than me. I just found it online, right? Um, I'm aware of it a little bit, but I Googled it online. Araniyar, Kosasthalayar, Kuam, and Adayar. And I'm sure most of the students will be aware of Adayar and Kuam. And Kosasthalayar and Araniyar is similar to that, just two other rivers that flow through Chennai. And one thing I have to understand is, um, you know, I'm sure due to, during the 2015 floods um, in which I was actually caught in Chennai and many others, your families may have to, um, these rivers um, exceeded their capacity and there were even, you know, many Facebook posts about, you know, um, if you build within uh, the lakes and if you build within the uh, rivers, um, how can you expect um, not to be flooded when it rains, you have to, uh, build outside the rivers, you have to build outside the lakes, which is correct, you know, and um, and um, exactly what they shared in those Facebook posts or what they are doing in Toronto to solve the flooding problem. It is um, not a very um, intellectually complicated thing to understand. It's more about implementation of the policies. And just to uh, make it simple and understandable, um, I would like to categorize the flooding into two, urban versus river in flooding. And uh, as the name suggests, you know, urban means in city areas, river in means in the rivers. So urban flooding generally um, is um, due to overflow of um, strong sewers. Um, if you don't exactly know what that means, in Tamil, we'll call it Padala Sagari. Um, it is generally under the roads, which are constructed by the municipality. And um, as you know, um, we cannot, we are not unlimited in space. We are really constrained in space, particularly in cities. So government municipalities have to work very hard to find space to put the pipes that can convey the water outside the roads and outside the urban areas. And um, they have certain standards, you know, which they follow in India, which they follow in Toronto, standards different, different standards are different in different countries and different jurisdictions. And um, I mean, the basic understandable logic, which everybody can understand is the bigger the pipe is, the lesser the chance of flooding, because more water will just go through the pipe. And um, that is true. Um, that is with urban flooding. And river in flooding is when rivers like Kuam, Kosasthalayar, and um, Adayar, and all of these rivers, um, during heavy rainfall, overflow um, out of their banks. And then the water spills over into the nearby houses and everything from the rivers. So I'm sure um, you've seen pictures. Some may have even had sad experiences with these floods. And um, we'll explore more on how to uh, combat these things. So, you know, there's been so much research done on this field throughout the world because, to be honest, um, no country is um, going to escape floods because there is rainfall in every country unless you are in the Sahara Desert uh, where they don't have water anyways. So there is rainfall in every country. And one thing we need to understand is we don't know how much is going to rain when. And in order to know how much is going to rain when, we use prediction technologies. And there are so many models, computer models, which use satellite imagery. And there are so many 
radars which send radar signals to check the clouds and stuff and they use all that in the tamil nadu meteorological department and you know their spokesperson previously mr raman and you might all remember him and uh, i am not uh, exactly aware of the current person uh, but um, his office uh, essentially um, uses all these things to predict floods and predict floods are rainfall are the weather conditions and tell us you know so even they don't know when it's going to rain how much but they can tell us there is a high chance of rain today and um they can only tell it for one or two days in advance they cannot tell it for one year in advance and all of you are probably aware of it so um so right now the problem we are facing um my apologies due to my sounds but um right now the problem we are facing is uh, we don't know when it's going to come how much rain because if we have a tap in our house we can open and close when we want but that's not how nature works and we have to prepare for um potential um rainfalls which may come in whatever amount in whenever time and um this particular thing makes water resource engineering a very specifically different engineering discipline because in every other engineering discipline we'll be able to predict and pinpoint exactly what is it for instance you take structural engineering you know i'm sure some of your professors are way more knowledgeable in that me so i didn't i may be wrong but i think like you can find out the bearing capacity of the beams and you know cantilevers and then you can find out the foundation bearing capacities based as based on the soil and um after it's set like within the building and within the after the um concrete is put and then the foundations are laid it is pretty predictable that okay this is the strength we want this is the amount of concrete mix we need to put this is the bearing capacity and this is the load the first floor the second floor can bear and it is completely predictable let us take computer programming you know if you if the program doesn't work it means you did something wrong you check everything and put it again and if you do it right it has to work but nature is always um, different suddenly we get rainfall suddenly we get coronavirus and that is how nature is so um what is so in that aspect is a particularly different discipline and because it's different we have some unique ways which is not generally conventional engineering but we have some unique ways to combat these problems and um um one of um the ways which is prerequisite to understand what i'm going to talk about is um is because the rainfall is unpredictable we have for infrastructure construction purposes that is the padala chakade or storm water infrastructure or you know sizing of certain channels or everything infrastructure construction purposes we have something called design storms and uh, in case within the short period of time any of you are not able to understand what i say i'm sure uh, professor kalayanan will be able to explain it in way more detail i'll try my best to do it in the short time um design storm is basically using previous rainfall which happened in the past 30 or more years to um to statistically um have an estimate not an accurate number we can't but have an estimate of how much chance there is rainfall so let us say uh, 2015 there is a very heavy rain and 2005 there is a very heavy rain and 1995 there is a very heavy rain and uh, let us say in between the years there has been some mild rains and whatever so we take the amount of rainfall for each year and then uh, each rainfall event and then uh, we you know put a statistical curve and then find the um a percentage chance of a specific quantity of rainfall occurring let us say um for instance uh, based on my some knowledge which i read online the 2015 chennai floods had one in 100 years chance of happening um we call it in hydrologic terms 100 year return period and um it basically means that um for that amount of water to fall in that short period of time there is only 1% chance in chennai so um 
the return period is just a different way to say percentages. So um, when there is only one percent chance of that amount of rainfall coming, um, how much are we willing to invest from Chennai's budget to combat one percent chance of something happening when we need that money for many other actual practical things right now? And that is why um, we don't see drastic changes that solve every flood problem suddenly because the government and many managements are also working on many different constraints, including medical constraints. They need to build hospitals. They need to build schools for children's education and they need to build universities, upgrade the universities. Many people need houses, people need to build. And everything is necessary. And this thing is one in 100 chance of happening. So because of this unique scenario, I think of flood protection like an insurance policy. You know, for instance, like if it's a health insurance, um, you pay like 2000 rupees a month, they'll cover you for, uh, you know, really, really serious cancer. And then you pay 10,000 rupees a month, they'll cover you for, you know, all your medicines and all your, um, uh, all your even fever and simple things. And if you pay like 15,000 rupees a month, like there are plans uh, in ICAC and everything, they will cover including dental they'll cover everything. So similarly, like if you invest more money in creating bigger infrastructure, you are always going to have lesser chance of being flooded and people dying and whatever. But not everybody buys insurance policies because it's really expensive. Similarly, um, if a city is still developing and the economic condition and the professional climate of the city is not very well off, like, you know, um, obviously, not to be little Chennai, I love Chennai, and uh, my wife is from Chennai, even though I am from a rural town in India. But Chennai is still developing compared to many other Western cities. And that is one reason why we can't afford to spend that much on the STROM uh, systems. So coming to this slide, sorry for uh, tangenting a little bit. So hard methods and soft methods. So hard methods, huge use huge strong infrastructure. They are expensive, but easy to implement. So let us say you need to put, let us say Paris Connor is uh, flooding, our Velachir is flooding often. So technically you can just dig up the whole road and put, you know, huge, huge, huge pipes to make sure they never flood. But that is probably gonna take the whole of Chennai municipality's budget to do one project like that. And it's not practical because they have many concerns and they are trying their best in some ways. And you know everybody has their weaknesses and strengths and whatever. So, um, and soft methods are the ones that are um, also expensive and difficult, but they can be implemented in a little more practical way. Let me expand on this a little bit. So, soft methods are a little bit more natural. Hard methods are a little bit more artificial. Um, you all know the hydrologic cycle, you know, rainfall falls down, goes under the soil, and then our rainfall goes in the river and then goes to the ocean and sunlight comes down and they evaporate and uh, clouds move to the cities and move to the land and then it rains, it also rains in the ocean. So, you know, this hydrologic cycle, water evaporates and condenses, and evaporate and condenses. So one of the things, um, that's very important to understand is water has to go underground. And if you think of a small return period event, like two year or 50% chance of rain happening, the rain that happens every year, if you go to a rural town in India, almost all water will infiltrate. I'm sure some of you from agricultural background can relate to this. Like once it starts raining the first week, almost there will be no runoff. Everything will be infiltrated because the soil just drinks the water. So that has to be the situation in Chennai too. But we have roofs, we have roads, and then we have so much infrastructure, uh, railway lines and everything. And obviously what falls in your roof, whether it is, um, you know, steel or whether it is concrete, whatever, they cannot go underground. And essentially for many of the events, like generally speaking, a majority of water goes underground, like 
I don't know the exact percentage. It varies from city to city. But uh, based on my knowledge, like even 40, 50 percent, like almost half of the water will go underground many times. And think of it like if in the 2015 Chennai floods, of the all water that came outside and just ravaged the homes, destroyed property, killed some people, sadly, if half of the water actually went underground and only half were remaining, what will be what would have been Chennai? It would have been much better, isn't it? And that is what these soft methods are trying to achieve. So the soft methods are, um, you know, using um, are trying to mimicry the natural system because um, we come from nature, we live with nature, and natural way is the only way we can solve problems long term. We can put huge pipes, but um, what if, like, obviously, Chennai is expanding, expanding, expanding. Um, more houses are being built and stuff. Let us say you put a huge pipe that takes water near Coom River into the ocean. What if uh, more buildings and more um, roads get built and the pipe cannot hold the water anymore? And what if even more buildings are built and you increase the pipe size and 10 years later that st pipe still can't bear the water because you designed it for 10 years ago. Now we have more buildings and more water is coming. So these hard methods, we can do it. Um, they are expensive. You have to do it repeatedly, but they're easy to implement in a sense that um, you can just go um, from a municipality's perspective, Chennai Corporation's perspective. If they want to use the hard methods, that's easy because they can go and uh, maybe expropriate or buy or use some land they have and then put some huge pipes under the road, whatever. And, um, and that's it. But the soft methods are the ones that are going to give lasting solutions to this problem, but are more harder to implement. For example, let us say everybody in Chennai tries to have a small garden on their roof. And let us say everybody in Chennai, you all probably heard when um, uh, Honorable Chief Minister Jayalalitha was previously there, um, they asked us to do Malayneer um, Segarapitita. And that is actually a very good thing. I remember me and my dad digging in my house, creating the system ourselves with the stones and river, you know, Atuman and everything. So what if every house in Chennai has that? When a flood is coming, a significant, if not 100%, but at least like 20, 30 or some percent of water, if every house and every building in Chennai has it, will go underground. Then if it goes underground, it's going to reduce the amount of water in the roads. It's going to reduce the amount of water in the storm sewer or Padala Chakra. It's going to reduce the amount of water in the rivers. And overall, it's going to make things better for everybody. And um, obviously, there is also another benefit that is it's going to recharge the groundwater. And obviously, we know the uh, uh, status of groundwater in Chennai. Um, not only that, it is much lower. There is also seawater intrusion in some areas uh, because of low groundwater pressure. So converting cities into sponges, sponges means things that soak up or urinify water. And those sponges, which I metaphorize, are basically those roof gardens, which have soil, which suck the water. Those, you know, Malayneer Segarpa things are infiltration trenches that get the water from the roof and take it underground. And these are the sponges that suck and soak the water, hold it. Um, and, um, um, and so um, that is the way to go. And that is the one which mimicries the environment. And that is the way in which we have a symbiotic and coexisting relationship with the nature as opposed to we being the destroyers of nature. And we all know, um, um, we all know. Yeah, we all know the um, um, situations of trees and forests and everything, deforestation and stuff. So, coming to the final point in this slide, um, expensive and difficult to implement. I just want to focus on difficult to implement for a bit because um, this is not a hard thing to understand. You know, it's like we are not Einstein level engineers who are trying to understand E equal to MC square and derive all the light years equation to bring mass from sun or anything. 
it's basically we need to get water to underground and not allow it to flow on the surface but the hard part is not the complex engineering but you know actually implementing it and uh, i don't blame anybody it's because it's genuinely difficult it's not easy and uh, how can we request every house in chennai to have a roof garden and can we force people are we sending going to send police with guns to make sure they have these things you know so uh, we need to have awareness maybe you know if you have your homes and uh, if you have some time this during this quarantine coronavirus time you can maybe dig up some soil and try to have some roof garden and it's good you can see the plants you'll have some time and then and um, you also can have some infiltration trench malanir sagara pitam when you stay at home and um um maybe next time when it rains um maybe first time when it rains you can check how much water is flowing out of your home if possible sometimes infrastructure doesn't allow it and then once you do that maybe the time after it rains like time it rains after you have this roof garden or uh, or what is that um infiltration trench you can check it again i'm sure you'll be able to see a difference and i'm sure you'll be able to understand what happens if each and every one of us does it you know everything has to be bottom up um together we are way stronger and any effort that's done together will be way more impactful than a few uh, a few activists just freaking out online about oh you know this is a problem that is a problem so you know we can share posts we can share memes about oh my god flood is coming everybody's building but what we can do practically some things and you know those are um, good things to start let me go to the next slide um sorry just one moment yeah so how do we reduce floods floods and this is you know i'm just trying to uh, explain the previous slide and take it to the next slide um we can do something during the flooding or we can prepare in advance for the flooding and all of us know preparing in advance is better than cure and it's not easy to prepare in advance so do something during flooding is basically like oh my god the flood came what are we going to do now and then we hire a bunch of water resource engineers or maybe engineers in pwd they check the amount of rainfall and they check the amount of water that's flowing in the river and then they prepare maps to check where water is going to flow and then they send police officers there and um, or you know first responders there to rescue the people and many of these you don't need you know in toronto they do it with water resource engineers but in india if it's flooding people are there anyway they will call the um, uh emergency line and police or fire may show up so that is doing something during the flooding which is necessary because we will be never we will never be able to 100% rule out flooding but preparing in advance for the flooding is what i talked about in the previous slide convert cities into sponges and you know each and every home encourage use your time to maybe have infiltration trenches and um sponges and rooftop gardening and stuff where rainfall just gathers and stays in the soil there and also construct proper infrastructure that can withstand flooding um what i mean by this is this like generally in toronto this is what they do like throughout the city they identify hot spots of uh flooding let us say you know velacheri is a flooding hot spot in chennai and um similarly there are some flooding hot spots in toronto uh, whose names you probably don't care about so let's talk about chennai like velacheri and some other places they identify these specific hot spots of flooding and i'm sure some officers in pwd are already doing it and um they find out what engineering construction we can do to alleviate or ease in the flooding problem like can we put bigger pipes on the roads or can we you know dig the river to clear out the sludge like thuru varra adu appdin solluvanga kulangal la but you can do that in river too so that the capacity of the river is higher 
and you know sometimes a uh, river or a side bank la breach a irundadna they will have you know um a levy or they'll have a wall that stops the river water from overflowing into a road or houses or whatever these kind of infrastructure in strategic locations strategic means places where you have to put it so that you you save a lot of people maximum damage reduction those kind of things you can uh, prepare in advance for flooding in these two ways and con- coming uh, to this i also want to recognize that there are even though in toronto i'm trying to reduce floods chennai is very very different from toronto and um, it's similar in many ways it's a city it's also different and i really want to recognize the differences because i don't want to assume that every solution we did in toronto are actually going to work in chennai so for example we can see this picture and um, the first point i put in the bullet is toronto is a moderately sloped city whereas chennai is a flat city it's very true because um, um i'm not exactly sure uh, maybe um um professor kalaimanan can then um, help you with this one um because he may be more aware of chennai but um i think previously when i was in anna university i remember uh, reading something that the highest point in chennai is probably just 10 meters higher than um you know some low parts and i was in anna university and i heard that above the mean sea level anna university was just 10 meters higher and and i remember when i was in 2015 chennai floods i was inside the hostel and every area around anna university is basically blown out with water we went to like kotorpuram and uh, we walked around those roads and um, a whole bridge was kind of soaked in water and i even have the pictures of me walking in streets with the water and i'm sure some of you have even experienced the sad situation and um if anna university is 10 meters higher than mean sea level and i walk out of anna university and everything is flooding those areas probably just 5 meters above the mean sea level which is 5 meters you may think oh my god that is 5 meters na it is a height of three people right generally uh, average guy is 1.8 meters high or 1.7 meters high so it's like three people stacked on top of each other is 5 meters so avlo uyaram irukume apdi ninga nenikalam but on a city scale it's very very low for example in toronto enna na high point vande it's almost like 70 80 meters or even higher so that slope is much higher what happens when the slope is higher abdi na water runs away from the city quickly but when the slope is low obviously gravity is the one that drives the water flow when the slope is low the water flows slower so there might need to be little more um, um little different approaches which have to be done in chennai and obviously this sponge method and um, these infrastructure methods will work too but we have to strategically employ these methods to suit chennai's needs um secondly when the enna apdina um toronto um is currently expanding very fast and chennai is also expanding everybody is building that is true but i think toronto is expanding little bit faster than chennai horizontally i mean chennai people are building skyscrapers in toronto people are expanding like building houses like the ones in this picture like expanding laterally so um toronto's policies are the flood prevention plans are geared towards these kind of a uh, uh, development new development so let me say so this picture i took it from a website i have put the link it is mahindra city and as you can see every house is similar the roads are in exactly correct width and then the roads are straight and then the houses are in clear order and this is how generally majority of toronto looks so when a development is like this we can say oh before the house you can see the green plants put an infiltration trench there the roof is perfect can you put some you know um rooftop garden there if the roof water comes direct the roof water into the garden in the middle of the road and take the road enough and put them into the garden in the middle of the road don't put it in the padala chakra underneath so we can do these kind of changes in these kind of development but as you all know chennai has this is a very very minute development in chennai and majority of chennai is not like this you know and this is how toronto looks like 
there is houses and the rows are you know clearly like a mesh and then the every house has a back area and a front area and then everything is planned and some areas of chennai looks like this and you know um you know there are houses each house is in different height and then each property is different shape each road is in a different uh, curve and um, we don't know e the gap between the road and houses change for every house and um these are in the old neighborhoods of chennai the new ones like the mahindra city are planned and this is not in any way me to like be little chennai i love chennai chennai is a great city and um i understand chennai has you know smaller roads you know roads that curve and whatever houses are you know in different shapes and sizes and um the reason is that um toronto and usa and all these countries don't have a history like india right indian tamil tamil is the oldest language in the world and um you know indian history is much 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 longer than the british history um and than the american history and people lived in chennai way before people lived in new york and people lived in chennai maybe even before people lived in london um definitely before people lived in toronto it's like the university i went to university of toronto is a very high ranking university top notch in the world but anna university cg is older than that university university of toronto came in 1850 anna university came in 1776 and anna university was built by the british right think of all the gurukulas in india and everything so um the truth is chennai is much older and even though having a long history is very good and great and we appreciate our language appreciate our history there are also some other sides which is the city is already built and city is already preset before even all these technologies cars and everything came in so if you ask if some of your parents and grandparents are from chennai if you ask them they will be able to explain you how chennai looked 100 years ago 50 years ago and chennai may have had many fields farm fields chennai may have had many cow cows bullock carts and everything so um the roads are developed uh, when um, some old neighborhoods the roads are developed in those times and but in toronto right now even though it's planned and mahindra city is perfectly planned and everything they can do it because they're developing when there are cars and when there are concrete and when there are everything so um this is i mean having a long history is good you know um this is our heritage this is good but we just have to put little more effort into um uh, solving these kind of flat problems so the second point i said you know long history means we have to live with and update the previously prepared roads and infrastructure which may not be planned perfectly for our current needs do i need some place for infil infiltration trench nobody can find a place in paris corner do i need some place for infiltration trench in some other you know neighborhood nobody can find place but in mahindra city we can right so um this is one problem and the other problem is um if you are a old city uh property ownership is a big issue um light is on property ownership is a big issue what i mean by property ownership is this like if every now when they go and build mahindra city they go and buy 100 acres of land and then they separate it into perfect plots and then they sell each similarly sized plot to somebody who wants to buy the house but obviously you all understand that is not how mandai valley works or that is not how um, velacheri works or anything because they are previously developed neighborhoods and um um and if you want to have a straight road in the mid half way into the road some guy's property line will be there and then if you want to have a uh, you know some space for uh, rainwater harvesting in the road or something um some places there may be space available and some places there may be some encroachments and there are people who already own it and everything all these property ownership previously built buildings it's not easy to demolish a building it's easy to say in facebook oh just go and destroy everything in the river it's easy to say but if you think about it there are people living there there are businesses that are actually happening 
people like you know let us say there's a xerox shop that is in the uh, near the river and that guy is taking 50 paise or 1 rupee xerox and then making his living uh, and then paying thou- you know 5000 10000 rupees and do you really want to destroy that building where is he going to put the xerox shop and all of those things are there so step by step these things will become better but there's no point in saying oh my god everybody is building in the thing and then you know these are terrible and then you know uh, everything has to be demolished destroy every building there's no point in doing that because one in 100% chance of flooding whereas people have to eat every day and people have to be that is more important so these are some differences and one other question i also want to um, say is uh, um are there any newly planned cities in india and when i was in india sometimes i used to go to google maps to see throughout the map of india to see how our cities look and at one point i went into new delhi near you know our parliament and rashtrapati bhavan and everywhere and i was really amused by how they have amazingly designed the city if you see the picture above you can see it's designed like a benzene hexagon you know but the bonds are not in the center i'm sorry i'm a nerd but um they are basically hexagons and have you seen any neighborhood in chennai like that so they are planned and it's possible to in, in india to do these things and you can see the green space between the houses so this area it's less likely to flood because every house and stuff has some garden and the rainfall will soak and go underground there the places are planned there is space between the roads you can put plants there are round anas in the middle there are plants you can send the water from the roads into there so that it doesn't flow on the padala chakade on the road you can do all those things and another thing is um, after telangana and andhra pradesh separated um, um, i think andhra pradesh is going to have a new capital um, i'm not sure whether it's andhra pradesh or telangana but amravati is a city and they are going to build a new city in india and this is the map which i found online they've started the construction i believe but it's not complete and maybe in the future if i come or if one of you guys after you become see uh, one of you people after you become engineers you can go and see that how much it's planned and a planned city is always always a more convenient and better city because you can implement things which you generally can't implement in in the in the picture i showed before where houses are all in different shapes and the roads are all in different shapes so coming to this we recognize that many parts of chennai are not planned and we recognize some parts are planned and this is the reality and we love our city and how can we make this better from this what we have and um, i think um it's um yeah for me it's 918 i think i have 10 to 12 minutes left and um, kalyan and please uh, message me in linkedin if you think i'm going over time i'll make it quick um i'll try to be um, as time constrained as possible and um, and i can also stay a little longer um, i just hope i don't um, um, inconvenience any of you um, so what can we do in chennai so as i discussed previously we can encourage green roofs green roofs means having gardens on the rooftop even a pot with a rose plant on your rooftop is going to retain some water when it's raining how much 1 liter 2 liter how many houses are there in chennai 1 lakh houses 1 lakh liters of water lesser during a rain event right so anything is going to add up bioretention bioretention is basically like a garden in the side of a road where you send the water from the re- uh, road and send the water from the roofs where water can go and pond in that small garden and then infiltrate you can bioretention is what i did my master's thesis on and permeable pavers this is a very good technology because in chennai we need paving we cannot say or oh, rip off every road there no road should be there everybody can walk we cannot say that so permeable pavers is also good alternative like you could have seen that in like some hotels or everywhere where before they have you know interlocking pavers they would have had it and if you have interlocking pavers there are gaps between the pavers where water can actually go in even though it may not function like a forest which soaks up all water it is still going to absorb some water and one thing we have to remember while doing permeable pavers is um um you know we have to have we cannot perfectly stick the permeable pavers together there should be some gap and then we cannot put cement in the gaps right we have to have river sand or something so that it infiltrates and 
there is also one other thing after you do the permeable paver once people start driving and once cars start going slowly dust gets accumulated and the efficiency of the water absorption reduces so sometimes in canada they use like a powerful water system to just spray water and clear up the space between the locking paver so that the water goes down and one other thing is this if you have a permeable paver what is the point of putting a permeable paver on top of a previously concrete bottom right it's not going to infiltrate anyway you have to put it on top of soil river sand and gravel so um we cannot put it on top of concrete right we we have to put it on uh, uh, on top of sand we have to put it on top of gravel so that it can go and then it can infiltrate and then one other thing is generally in in canada it is not recommended to drive bulldozers over the permeable pavers or over the places where you are going to put permeable pavers because it presses the soil so much the soil cannot absorb water anymore so all of these concerns are there and we have just putting a bunch of permeable pavers not sufficient we have to do it right and silva sills is something where um um this may be a new term to you but this is a new technology where what they do is this so like you have you might have seen on the road sides they have plant trees and then they put fence around trees right so sometimes those trees don't grow because the trees cannot send their roots anywhere so this is basically they dig up a whole bunch of soil and then they put a plastic frame and then they put soil underneath and they build the road above the frame a strong plastic frame so that the weight of the buses and bikes and stuff don't press the soil so the soil underneath is not compressed it can infiltrate and it can give room for tree roots but above it the buses can go and the weight of the buses will be distributed through the strong plastic beams to the area under the plant root and under the soil which can infiltrate maybe to the stones and that is a silver cell technology infiltration trenches mineer sagrapitam and they come in different shapes and sizes it comes like a big square before your house behind your house it can also come like a small tube in the small space you have with gravel it also helps and we have to emphasize on planning new neighborhoods properly with storm water planning so new cities like mahindra city they built like this we have to encourage it good for them go for it because they are the kind of neighborhoods all of us want to move in the future and they are the ones that are going to be able to address all the issues we want to address because only planning solves anything preemptively and slowly increase standards for the new storm infrastructure creation while updating and maintaining old ones to create to higher standards so you may not know it but there is a building code in tamil nadu and i'm sure your professors know it and um and those building standards in tamil nadu are updated once in a while you might have heard recently about the environmental impact assessment update there are critics and there are proponents of it um but in any case um there are building codes in chennai and for tamil nadu and i quickly went through the tamil nadu building code document online you can literally go online and search tamil nadu building codes and it will appear it's a big pdf document you can read through it and comparing to what i read they've done reasonably good for chennai and everything but we have to increase the standards it's not possible to do it today we cannot say just increase everything then we can do anything so step by step slowly you know maybe once um you know chennai is little bit more economically developed the government has more tax money to invest little bit more in road side plants and stuff which can infiltrate water and then after that the new roads we can have a rule that they have to have road side plants this kind of stuff we can maintain the old infrastructure we have we can upgrade the infrastructure like the padala chakra there was once near um the american embassy in chennai i believe um padala chakra broke and a bus went inside and um you know it's i understand you know it's hard to maintain a whole city complicated city like chennai like can one of us go and stop something like that right now it's not easy they are trying their best and we just have to try to push them and try to make it a little bit higher standard because government needs money to correct it and um all of these things so um this point 
the first one in this slide is um, I, I put it because um, even though I'm reluctant, the it's not easy to say this um, request removal with all due diligence to fairness, historic and ethical concerns of building that are already within the flood line. So I understand we shouldn't have floods, but it is it may be nicer based on a flood perspective to remove the buildings in the flood line, but it's not possible all the time. Let us say there is a very historic building in Chennai with beautiful architecture in close to a river. Even though it's going to be flooded, we probably want to maintain the history, right? We don't want to destroy that building and ethical concerns. So when I was going in the Chennai Metro Rail's overhead rail, I used to like go near the Park Town railway station, um, the overhead rail, which goes down. Some of you may remember it. And near there, it kind of crosses over the Kuom River. And I used to see small houses near slum areas near the river. And those houses, if it's flood, all of them are going to float. That's true. But are we going to just go with a bunch of bulldozers and rip apart everything? for like you know answer flooding they have to live there every day where are they going to live right so once more people are educated and once we improve our standards once more companies come to india once business is better once the economic conditions are better more people will be able to afford houses and people will automatically move out of those areas which are flood prone we cannot force um, people who already face so much hardships into somewhere out so there are ethical concerns and there is fairness literally like you know, the property, rent, and real estate market is so vicious. People cheat, people lie, and these things happen all the time in business. And it happens in many places too, in fact. And, um, and what we can do is, let us say, you know, there is a government project given to Mahindra City or something. Let us leave out the name Mahindra, right? It's, you know, sorry, I don't want to mention, I shouldn't be mentioning any specific name. My apologies for mentioning Mahindra. Let us say X, Y, Z, City Developments is near a river and the government gave them permit, let us say. And trusting in that permit, let us say I am the developer who is building all the buildings to sell. I invest my money. And then if the government gave permit and then, um, suddenly a bunch of activists come and say you have to remove everything all the money i worked and invested in building the new building to rent out to some people are gone Be and that is not fair to me because the government gave permit but at the same time i understand there is a bunch of confusion in permitting and there are you know little bit improper things sometimes done there too i'm not um, pointing fingers on anybody there are problems everywhere so we have to try to be fair and uh, we have to understand the background and how people got there and everything, all these things have to be taken in consideration before we say remove that building. So, you know, and then undertake flood prevention projects that create channels and infrastructure that protects people and property from flooding. Yeah, you know, undertake, do hydraulic analysis, do hydrologic analysis, find out the important highly flood prone areas, build dikes, build levees that can withstand certain amount of floods so that it, we can safeguard the areas. And some of these changes will happen only when economic condition improves. And to be honest, anybody who works hard, tries to get a good job, tries to start a company, bring business to Chennai, is indirectly contributing to Chennai's <clears throat> flood reduction because they are going to be paying taxes to the government. That is the one that's, uh, that is used for this pro project. They are going to be producing jobs for some people. And only if people get jobs, they can move out of slums and get you know, <clears throat> other bigger houses and stuff, which are safer for them and for everybody. Some will take very long time. You know, it is not, you know, we cannot come with a huge hammer and implement everything. You know, uh, people love life, people love their city, people love the childhood place they grew up. Nobody can, forget uh, the place they grew up, even if they grew up in a slum. And people love it. And step by step, these things will improve. And we will try our best based on economic development and technologies and fairness and ethical concerns to try our best to reduce flooding and destruction of life. Um, this final point I said, it's not that we cannot understand the hydrologic and hydraulic principles for flood prevention. Almost all Chennaiites can understand it if they try to learn it since it's not that complicated. It's more about how do we implement all of this in a complicated, complicated city like Chennai. And that's true. It's like, you know, the hydraulic, hydraulic and hydrologic concept. If you, I understand, you know, 
many students won't completely focus on your studies right now and i had friends and sometimes Sometimes I didn't focus on my studies completely too. I wish I studied more, but um, I think if every student think about it, if you fully, very interestingly, um, the way you watch a complicated movie, try to really understand the hydrology of Chennai, hydraulics of Chennai, you will be able to master it. I think any student you probably master it in six months to one year. It is not rocket science. It is not. you know hicks bosons it is not finding out a new atom you know yeah you if you want to learn your professors can help you if you are more interested you know you can um contact your seniors who have jobs there are several courses online there are people who do phd's those reports are in different libraries there are books there are so many things and then if you you know spend some time it's it's not that uh, complicated uh, to learn them but the issue is um to implement all these things that is you know everybody can understand everybody can think lying is bad and it's not easy to not lie everybody can think okay converting a city to sponge is good but it's not easy to do it because think about it let us say that um two people are building houses and selling them two businesses one business guy puts a rooftop garden so that he can help the environment another business guy does not put a rooftop garden and this guy wants to sell his house for 1 lakh rupees and the guy without the rooftop garden wants to sell his house for 90000 rupees how many of you will be willing to spend the extra 10000 rupees for a more environmentally friendly house yeah and that is the thing everybody wants to get away with what they can and get their money and then everybody else let them do the environmental stuff that are more expensive and we have to have a that is not going to work and we all know it like everybody has a justice ammeter inside if there is something unjust or if others are doing worse thing in the business and getting away with it everybody will start doing it so implementing is the problem it's not the complicated thing everybody can understand it so so <clears throat> um this is the first page is the tamil nadu combined development building rules 2019 it's in this link and i think our government um in a complicated state with so much history and so much um, other concerns and currently corona virus and stuff you know it's not easy to be an ias officer it's not easy to be a minister and do everything they are not um sitting in their chairs and ordering their minions to do everything they are working hard and it's not easy so they are trying their best let us also try our best and as economic development continues we will be able to offer more expensive flood control measures step by step we will move forward and um with this um i thank you all for your kind attention and um um i hope um i didn't bore you with my any of nerdiness or whatever and um and um i respect you all for coming and i really thank um um professor kalayanan and your hod and other professors who are involved for organizing these things um each thing they do that counts for the goodness of our city goodness of our state and um step by step we'll move forward and i'm i'll be happy to take any of your questions and thank you very much for your kind attention thank you always uh, for the very informative session uh, now we'll move on to this uh, question and answer session so if audience any of you have any questions you can uh, post them in the chat box or you can uh, straight away one by one you can switch on your mic and uh, raise your questions thank you okay uh, good evening mr alvis uh, thank you for the wonderful lecture can you hear me hello hello yeah we are hearing you yeah okay yeah. Uh, i am sarana kumar from uh, nit tiruchi uh, i would like to have one question like uh, you have mentioned that uh, the the uh, tornado city was developed and uh, like uh, it was well planned city in canada right excuse me am i audible 
Hello. Um, sir, um. Hello. Uh, yeah, sir. Uh, could you hear me? Sir, so may I know uh, the guidelines for uh, the norms which is being followed in that city for uh, avoiding such kind of floods there? Like, is there any specific guidelines there uh, for the construction of building or whatever? Like, uh, you have to have a compulsory rooftop uh, gardening like that. Is there any mandate guidelines? I, I think that this uh, we are lagging here uh, in Chennai. Uh, actually, government has already been insisting continuously that every household should have that water, rainwater harvesting uh, tank and all. But uh, I do not know how many people are following uh, in Chennai. And the, the authorities uh, who are in the position of giving the permission for the construction of buildings should check those things and all then give the permission. I do not know whether they are doing it properly or not. Then how can uh, it be possible that we can prevent flood in future? And recently IIT Madras uh, professors also gave a warning to Chennai that uh, uh, Chennai is uh, uh, Chennai is going to face another flood uh, in near future. Well, Mr. Kalaipan, I hope uh, you are just left the meeting with Parrish. Yes, ma'am. All. Yes, ma'am. I think my mistake has left the meeting. Is is uh, messaging me? Yes, yes, yes. Okay, so what we could ask him to join again. Hello, am I audible? Uh, yes, sir, Ramana Kumar, you are uh, audible, but unfortunately, uh, the speaker has left the session. You please wait for some time. Uh, yeah, okay. okay, okay, okay. I thought okay. I have left. No, no, no. Actually, you are audible. Yes. So I think he has left uh, the session. So we will ask him to join back. Yes, he has joined, ma'am. He has joined. Yes. yes. Again, so that uh, he has joined. I'll be said, join. Should, yeah. Should I ask the question again? Um, I, I don't think yes. Uh, <laughs> yes, I heard your question completely. Yeah, yeah. Better you post it uh, in a chat box over so that chat box. Uh, okay, okay, okay. I'll do it. I'll ask him to read out. Yeah, that would be better, yeah. Uh, it's saying it will join in one minute. Yeah. So. My apologies. Can you hear me now? Uh, ah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yes, yeah. Sir. Uh, due to some uh, technical difficulty, it got confused. My apologies. Uh, yes, Mr. Saravana Kumar. Uh, yeah. Uh, yes, sir. Uh, shall I have put my question in the chat box? Uh, no worries. I'll ask my question again. Uh, sir, it was a wonderful presentation. At first, I must thank you for giving uh, such a nice presentation. Then, yeah, no problem. Thank you very much. Uh, yeah, okay. So, sir, uh, is there any guidelines in uh, Toronto City that uh, every householder should follow in order to avoid flooding or uh, 
like uh, we follow here that every household should have rain water harvesting tank or uh, some guidelines were proposed by you also like uh, rooftop gardening or uh, uh, having uh, partial amount of water the roof of uh, itself so that it uh, it does not reach the ground in the first uh, week of the rain like that mm-hmm. so are there any guidelines that uh, that have been made mandatory in that city that we are lagging here yes uh, you are right um, there are so many guidelines that are mandatory here i went through the tamil nadu building codes uh, the document i sent and um, compared to what is in here um, it is not uh, comparatively detailed that is true but okay. um, we must also recognize that um, it's not currently possible to implement every aspect of the guideline in toronto in chennai due to many other concerns including chennai's topography and uh, um, development stage but also primarily the economic condition and everything because the guideline guidelines here are stro- so stringent that um, okay let us say there is the the property value is almost double or triple what it should be because of the guidelines here you know what i mean oh. okay so let us say there is a house that whose cost is 20 lakhs right um any okay. new house that could be built has to have all these environmental features including rooftop gardens including rainwater harvesting and everything these might sound simple to you but they they have so many environmental concerns here including let us say cement factory they have to follow all these standards then that's it the cement price goes up and then let us say building houses they have to plan this way and then if you plan it means you need to plan space between the roads and the building and then you need to leave space each space is money and then um, if you want to add all these environmental features in the building each house is more expensive so it's it's basically like an insurance policy the more you can afford the better it's for you but we do the things we can afford yeah okay thank you thank you but it is it is true there are guidelines here those guidelines can be accessed online you can just google toronto storm water management guidelines and i'm sure those documents will show up you can read them yeah okay sure thank you thank you for the question is there any questions i wish and uh, there is another one question asked by the participant sure. baki rashmi sure what about the limitations in what about the limitations in providing Please. those silvers so the limitations of the silver cells in india yeah okay um thank you for the question um that is a nice question because um based on the current space constraints in chennai silver cell is probably the best thing maybe after the rooftop gardening which we can apply um because silver cell is specifically made for places this uh, space constraint it's a very good question so the thing is this the everything we do for storm water management uh, requires space except rooftop gardening and silver cells because you need to have an infiltration trench um, sometimes you can have it under your house if you are able to uh, engineer it properly but generally you need to have something outside your house and then um if you need to plant plants if you need to have biotension everything needs space but silver cell is something where you can have the silver cell under the road and have the road above it. if it's a rooftop gardening you can have the garden above the roof and you have the house under it so those are the kind of things that can 
work in a little better way in chennai due to the space constraints and um what are the constraints in uh, coming to the question um i can think of one or two constraints at the top of my head um silver cell because it's underground um you probably will find it hard to have silver cell let us say near madras university near marina beach i think it will be a little hard to have silver cells because the ground water is already pretty high uh, possibly due to the ocean water because silver cell is under the road it means it is not in the surface it's already deep so the ground water has to be reasonably deep uh, to be for it to be able to work so as long as um, the ground water is reasonably deep um, i think silver cell is a pretty good system for india so any other questions uh, from audience um from the audience uh, yeah uh, i wish like uh, i think uh, so i have one uh, specific question uh, which is away from our top today's topic uh, so how an a student uh, uh, can approach i mean uh, can apply for internship i mean especially our undergraduate students in abroad universities especially in canada because you have uh, you got a fellowship Uh, also so you have that experience I mean you got that uh, thing so could you please uh, share your experience and how one student could approach for uh, applying internship in abroad um yes um for sure um i would be happy to um um first um the people in abroad anywhere you are applying for internship uh, will care about your present academics and your interest in studies and your grades and uh, the projects you do the kind of presentations you attend the competitions you go and all these kind of things add up so it's easy to send applications to go places abroad it's easy to uh, just go to like a consulting company and give them 2 lakh rupees to get a visa to canada but none of that is going to work if um, grades are low or if uh, you don't have interest in civil engineering or these kind of stuff so the first and foremost is we need to study civil engineering with deep interest trying to learn as much as possible care about engineering love engineering and um try to do research try to learn more um and at the same time so the thing is this um going to abroad can be a goal but if it is after and below your goal of studying and learning civil engineering you will easily come abroad but if coming abroad is your goal and you don't even care about civil engineering you will find it very difficult so and so that's the thing so be great in engineering and after you have good scores you have good internships you have good projects then um there are certain competitions that are worldwide which canadian government conducts um that um chooses the brightest hard working smartest very passionate students and it's not easy to get them i'm not telling this to boast about myself i'm telling it because if you don't care about civil engineering you might as well not apply because they'll find it out in your first statement or in your first video interview so then there is a thing called my tax that is canadian government and there is something called dad for germany there is something called chapak for france and um 
all of these information are available online and um they are also available in websites so their application process everything is way more detailed than tamil nadu engineering applications process like it is very clearly set out online so once you go to their website you probably won't have any questions to me and you can also email their help email which will be in their website so i would put in the uh, chat um these three names and once you uh google these names you will be able to get all the information you need and i am sure these are the three things i am aware of and i am sure there are other things which um are aware for other countries like new zealand or uh, so i think like to be honest canada usa and new zealand uk bunch of all western countries are different in some ways but similar in many ways they all you know have high standards for storm water they all want smart passionate hard working engineers whatever so everywhere they have these programs to take the top brains because they want the brains and um, let me know if you have any clarifying questions i because the process is so long and their website details it um i just don't want to go over every single bit of it because it will take a lot of time so yeah good evening sir yeah i think it's good morning <laughs> yeah uh, yeah for sure yeah it's okay no <laughs> sorry uh ipo tamil la pesalama sir epdi yeah sure of course no problem <laughs> ஓகே இப்போ சென்னையில படிக்கிற இன்ஜினியரிங் கிராஜுவேட்ஸ்க்கும் கேனடால படிக்கிற இன்ஜினியரிங் கிராஜுவேட்ஸ்க்கும் சப்ஜெக்ட் வைஸ் ஆர் எல்ஸ் பிராக்டிகல் வைஸ்ல ஏதாவது டிஃபரன்ஷியேட் இருக்குமா நம்ம டெக்னிக்கல் சைடும் சரி ஆஸ் பர் கன்ஸ்ட்ரக்ஷன் சைடும் சரி எப்படி சார் அது அது கண்டிப்பா இருக்கும் ஆனா எனக்கு என்னன்னா எப்பவுமே வந்து இந்தியால இது மோசம் இந்தியால அது மோசம்னு சொல்றது எனக்கு பிடிக்காது ஓகே ஓகே எப்பவுமே வந்து இந்தியால இது மோசம் அது மோசம்னு சொல்றேன்னு பிடிக்காது ஆனா டிஃபரன்ஸ் இருக்கு உண்மைதான் என்ன அப்படின்னா இங்க வந்து பிராக்டிக்கல் எம்பசிஸ் வந்து ரொம்ப அதிகமா இருக்கும் இப்ப வந்து பேசிக் எக்ஸாம்பிள் சொல்லணும்னா இப்போ இப்போ டென்த் டுவெல்த் மேக்ஸ் புக்ல ஒவ்வொரு சாப்டர் முடிஞ்சு கடைசியில வந்து இருக்கிறதுலயே காம்ப்ளிகேட்டடான ஒரு கொஸ்டின் இருக்கும் தெரியுமா அதே அதே மாதிரி உள்ள கொஸ்டின்ஸ் தான் இங்க எல்லா எக்ஸாம்லயுமே வரும் ஓகே ஓகே டெஃபினிஷன்ஸ் எல்லாம் கம்மியா தான் இருக்கும் அடிக்கடி எல்லாரும் வந்து பிராக்டிகலா பண்ண பார்ப்பாங்க ஒரு ஒரு கோர்ஸ் படிச்சு முடிக்கிறவங்களால இப்ப வந்து வாட்டர் சோர்ஸ் இன்ஜினியரிங் கோர்ஸ் படிச்சு முடிக்கிறவங்க ஆக்சுவலா போய் ஒரு ஃபிளட் ப்ரிவென்ஷன் ப்ராஜெக்ட்ல ஓரளவுக்காவது பண்ணிருவாங்க அவங்க இன்ஜினியரிங் கன்சல்டிங் போய் எக்ஸ்பீரியன்ஸ்ல அப்புறம் நிறைய படிப்பாங்க ஆனா ஓரளவுக்காவது ஓகே இப்ப எங்க வீட்டுக்கு பின்னாடி ஒரு ஆறு இருக்கு அங்க வந்து வெள்ளம் வருது ஆஹ் எவ்வளவு மழை பஞ்சா எவ்வளவு தண்ணி வரும் அப்படின்னா ஓரளவுக்காவது கேல்குலேட் பண்ணிருவாங்க ஏன்னா அவங்க வந்து படிக்கும் போதே மழை பெய்யுது இப்போ எக்ஸாம்பிளுக்கு இங்க நான் ஒரு கோர்ஸ்ல டீச்சர் யூஸ் பண்றேன் இங்க வந்து வாட்டர் ரிசோர்ஸ் இன்ஜினியரிங் கோர்ஸ் ஹைட்ராலிக்ஸ் அண்ட் ஹைட்ராலஜி கோர்ஸ் அந்த கோர்ஸ்ல ஒரு எக்ஸசைஸ் என்னன்னா எல்லாரும் ஒரு குட்டி பாத்திரம் எடுத்துட்டு அவங்க வீட்டுக்கு மேல போய் என்னைக்காவது ஒரு நாள் மழை பிடிக் பண்றதுக்கு முந்தின நாள் போய் வச்சிருந்தோம் வச்சுட்டு எல்லாரும் அவங்க வீட்டோட ஜிஐஎஸ் லொகேஷன் அதாவது கோஆர்டினேட் யூனோ வாட்எவர் ஃபார்ட்டி த்ரீ பாயிண்ட் பிளா 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 நார்த் அண்ட் ஈஸ்ட் அப்படி இருக்குல்ல அதையும் எடுத்துட்டு அவங்க அவங்க வீட்டுல அந்த பாத்திரத்துல எவ்வளவு வாட்டர் தேங்கி இருக்கு அப்படின்னு கண்டுபிடிக்கணும் கண்டுபிடிச்சிட்டு எவ்ரிபடி பாத்திரம் ஷுட் பி த சேம் டயமீட்டர் ஆர் சம்திங் அப்படின்னா ஈக்குவலா இருக்கும் அதுக்கப்புறம் மொத்த கிளாஸ் ஆஃப் சாண்ட் வந்து மொத்த டேட்டாவே எடுத்து ட்ரான்டா சிட்டிங் ஃபுல்ல தீசன் பாலிகான் மேப் ப்ரிப்பேர் பண்ணுவோம் அது ட்ரான்டா சிட்டி வந்து இன்ஃபைல் வச்சு வச்சிருக்கோம் So, literally, that is one of the things that you have to do. You have to study a lot of lessons, you have to study a lot of questions, you have to study a lot of exams, you have to study a lot of things. But, you have to study a lot of things. You have to study a lot of things. Okay, sir. 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 But, there is a difference. I am going to study a lot of things. But, what is the difference? To the credit of the Indian system, here is the... Uh, number of uh, students to number of professors vandu ratio kondu different ah irukku 
ப்ரொஃபஸர்ஸ் அதிகமா இருப்பாங்க ரெண்டாவது வந்து இங்க உள்ள ப்ரொஃபஸர்ஸ்க்கு ரொம்ப ஹையான எஜுகேஷன் கிடைச்சிருக்கும் அவங்க அவங்க வந்து இப்போ எம்ஐடி இல்லைன்னா யூனிவர்சிட்டி ஆஃப் ப்ரோண்டா இல்லைன்னா பெர்க்லி அங்கே எங்கேன்னு படிச்சு வந்துருப்பாங்க அவங்க வந்து இந்த மாதிரி கருங்களை இப்போ வந்து அவங்க வந்து இந்த மாதிரி இதுகளில் வந்து டாப் நாலேஜ் எல்லாமே அவங்க படிக்கும்போது அவங்களுக்கு கிடைச்சிருக்கு அதனால வந்து அவங்களுக்கு அந்த மாதிரி கிடைச்சனால தான் அவங்களால அதை கொடுக்க முடியுது ஸோ ஸ்டெப் பை ஸ்டெப்பாக இது இம்ப்ரூவ் ஆகும் டிஃப்ரென்ஸ் இருக்க தான் செய்யுது ஆனா இப்போ உள்ள கன்ஸ்டன்ஸ் மத்தியில நம்ம ஒரு ஸ்டெப் பெட்டர் ஆகிட்டோம்னா என்னொரு அஞ்சு வருஷத்துல அஞ்சு ஸ்டெப் பெட்டர் ஆயிடும் So, uh, if there is any, uh, there is no questions, then uh, we quickly move on to uh, the end of the session. That is a vote of thanks. So, I request uh, um, Dr. Vee Balan, Mr. Dr. Vee Balan. Thank you, Kalevanan. Dr. Vee Balan, to uh, give a vote of thanks. I thank... Thank you, Kalevanan. I thank Mr. Alvish for his uh, kind acceptance of our invitation for delivering a webinar on the topic Chennai for Flood Prevention. I once again thank him for sharing his valuable experience in the field of flood mitigation in Toronto and by comparing with the areas in Chennai that is really amazing and his high opening views in the field of rainwater harvesting flood management and its control like bio retentions and silver cells these two terms are very new for us I hope this will webinar will make our students to choose their research work in the field of flood management I once again thank our HRD and faculty members of Civil Engineering Department for their support in conducting the webinar. And Lord, but not least, I thank all the participants for your active participation. Thank you, thank you, thank you all. Thank you very much. over to kalevan session and uh, thank you so much uh, uh, to spare yeah so thank you for your time uh, Thank you.